Welcome to Leesburg Alliance Church. I see we're bursting at the seams this morning. <laughs> That's all right. Uh, the most important thing is that Jesus is here. And uh, this is a special morning. Uh, we have uh, a special speaker this morning, uh, Pastor Roberto Joel Melendez. And that's just a fraction of his name. Uh, but he's going to be sharing the word with us. And uh, I know that uh, we've got some folks that are not with us today. The Hudsons are not here. And uh, Janet is not well. Um, and we, we just got word that uh, uh, Melba is having some problems. And so Joe and Melba are not here. But the uh, Johnsons are here this morning. And they were here last week too. And uh, we may see a visit or two before the morning is over. So uh, that's okay. Uh, everybody's supposed to be here is here. Amen. Okay. Um, I also mentioned that uh, at the end of the service, that's after the closing song, Lynn has an announcement before we have the benediction. Is that correct? Yes. Okay, so I won't be scolded for forgetting. No. <laughs> you know, she's very good. So, um, um, I'd like for us to stand for the scripture reading. Uh, Revelation chapter 5, verses 11 and 12. And if you would just uh, read this together with me, please. Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands, and ten thousand times ten thousand, they encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders. And in a loud voice they were saying, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and 
strength and honor and glory and praise. Remain standing for our opening hymn. And we'll sing this hymn through twice.
49 had pre-registered, and then there were several calls that came in subsequently. So we up that we're probably going to be somewhere between 50, 60 people before the dust settles. So uh, it was really exciting. And uh, uh, Helen was uh, with us, and Nelson, and Ada, and uh, John would have been with us, except that he was busy working at the uh, eye shop. <laughs> and um, Joy would have been with us, except uh, she's home nursing her husband, who is not with us today. So uh, it, was a, it was a good Sunday, a uh, good number of volunteers from the Alianza. Uh, it was really kind of an exciting day. I think a taste for what God has down the road as we work together with La Alianza for the Kingdom. Mm -hmm. um, I have a video, and I want to warn you that uh, you're going to think something stuck. So uh, just be patient with the first couple slides, because they go slow, and there's no sound, and then all of a sudden, boom. so nothing's wrong, but you'll enjoy the second.
because man would listen to you and go out and fill the earth, you confounded their language and sent them out. They had to go because they couldn't get along. Now, Lord, we're asking that men want to call on you and be fruitful and multiply, to remove those barriers, and Lord, make it easier for them to grasp the language that we can talk together and talk to you and communicate with one another. We thank you for the work that you're doing. And Lord, not just in the mind, but in the hearts of people. Reach them. We pray as we lifted hands this morning, there's things on people's minds and hearts that only you know about better than they do. Lord, encourage them that it doesn't go unnoticed. Yes. We pray especially for uh, Joe and uh, uh, Melba this morning yes. in their, their moment of need. Lord, uh, just bless them and help in ways they need help. We cry out for help this morning. Yes. We thank you for Cliff and Helen and the years they've had together. Yes. And Lord, for the things that's on their heart for their son today. May he sense that he's being prayed for this morning. And Lord, we pray for our country. We know that men and women are struggling to present their ideas and their minds to do their best. Help us to work together Amen. as we have over the years. And been a great nation because of you. Amen. Intervene on our behalf, Lord. Yes. And those who don't know you, Lord, the people would come to know you through our hard times. More of them would uh, turn to you and ask for help. We ask it in Christ's name. Yes, amen. Amen. I would like to introduce Terry to you as well. Just kind of stand up, look around. And, uh, she's, she's the one that makes him work. Thanks. <laughs> Amen. You're glad you don't have to pay her to do it. Yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> okay. Maybe I should play this through one time just so that make sure that they're familiar with it. Yes. Okay.
Hallelujah.
worship upon to the Lord. Amen. Amen. Uh, first of all, I want to say it is a privilege and a blessing for me and my wife, Terry, to be here with you today to share the word of God and to lead in worship. Amen. Um, that's uh, something that uh, we can never escape from. You know, we always uh, in worship. And uh, we love to praise the Lord. So excuse uh, if some notes were not there, <laughs> you know, but the Holy Spirit is here. Amen. Amen. The Holy Spirit is here. Um, Pastor Ed already had my wife stand up and say hello. Um, that's my wife, Terry. Um, we are blessed again to be here. Um, and it's amazing to see what the Lord is doing um, with our churches. Um, we are, we are the Christian and Missionary Alliance, Amen. okay, and we are a people uh, chosen to God to proclaim the gospel, that Jesus is our healer, he's our sanctifier, he's our savior, and he's our coming king. Amen. And uh, I am so privileged uh, to be part of the Christian and Missionary Alliance. Um, Another day I'll speak a little bit in more of a personal setting about me and uh, you can get to know a little bit of my background. But uh, today let's go into the Word of God. And uh, when I received the program uh, of the uh, reading that was going to take place uh, for today's service, um, I started to, to read um, this passage and uh, I felt that uh, the Lord was speaking to me, you know, to speak about this and to preach about this this morning. Amen? And uh, we want to call this message, Jesus, worthy of all worship. And the lyrics of what we're singing has really taken us there um, when we hear this content and we hear the theology that is embedded into what we're singing and the knowing of what we're singing about and whom we are singing to, it makes a huge difference. And I want to begin by, before we read the reading that we read earlier, of giving a definition of what is worship. Um, and worship, and we're going to call this biblical worship, biblical worship, involves our whole being. According to uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23, it involves our whole being, our spirit, our soul, and our body. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 23, it says, May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, biblical worship is not just a cerebral pursuit. It's not a thing of the mind alone. It's not an emotional exaggeration or a mystical consciousness. 
There was a particular time when we were singing that I felt touched by the Holy Spirit because the knowledge of what I'm singing makes me weep in front of the Lord to recognize this. So it's not a mystical consciousness. It's not an emotional exaggeration. It is real. Worship is a presentation of our entire being ignited by the Holy Spirit as a living sacrifice to God because we recognize who he is and what he has done. That is biblical worship. That is biblical worship. In the reading that we read in Revelations 5, chapter, uh, chapter 5, verses 11 and 12, and I'm going to ask you to have your Bibles open or your phone open where there it is, because we're going to navigate today in this uh, passage of Revelations 5. Verses, verse 11 and 12 says, and again we read, Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands, and ten thousand times ten thousand. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders in a loud voice. They were saying, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Father God, may you speak to us today as you have already been speaking to us. As we sing upon to your name and, you know, in recognition of how unworthy we are of receiving such mercy. We thank you and we ask you to speak to our hearts through your word that we may be edified, motivated by it. In the name of Jesus, amen. When we look at the book of Revelations in a whole, um, and specifically this passage, um, we might feel tempted into going into eschatological interpretation, to go into eschatology and to try to interpret all the symbolisms and the images that are there. Um, we could do that, but we're not going to do that today. Today, what we want to focus is on the profound idea that is in this passage, and it's going to be answered as we pay attention and read, okay, the profound idea um, in this passage is something else that we're going to see. Amen. God has a book. In this passage, if you read the context of the book of Revelation, it refers that God has a book, a scroll. And this, in this scroll in, uh, in which the history of the universe is already written, he has written the history of the world in advance. He holds in his hand the history of the world in advance, and he initiates the consummation of all history. And only, only one is worthy to open that book, to open that scroll. Only one is worthy. So the question is, who is worthy to open that scroll? Who is worthy of our worship? Now, when we go by definition, the word worthy means having or showing the qualities or abilities that merit recognition in a specific way. In other words, good enough to be admired, good enough to be revered, good enough to be deserving. And if we go in a worldview, looking at things in a worldview, you know, there are lots of things that the world says that uh, renders a person to be worthy. Lots of things. In the world that we live in, worthiness is obtained in many cases because of your education, your financial status, how connected you are to people and people of influence or being an influencer. That's one of the, the, the new things. You know, people call, call themselves an influencer because they open up a YouTube channel and they have a great following of people because they say funny things. <laughs> And those people become worthy because of the content that they create and they become revered and admired. In the world that we live in, um, worthiness comes from 
what you can obtain and get out of something or somebody or a relationship. We try to do things to acquire worthiness, to acquire worth, and think that we can meet a set of expectations and become worthy by doing the things that the world deems to make me worthy. What a lack of focus. When we see this passage, and we go to verses 1 through 4, the Bible says, Then I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, Who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside it. I wept and wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside. Now you need to remember that in this book of Revelations, this is John who is writing what he is seeing in a revelation, what he is seeing in a vision. And at this point, I want you to realize that the emphasis is not on the content of the scroll, but on its seals. And the one who is worthy to take it, the one who is worthy to open it, the one who is worthy to look inside of it. A lot of people get immersed in the aspect of interpreting the scroll and the seven seals. And the seven seals mean this and mean that. And there is some interpretation, you know, to that. But at the end of the day, the profound idea here is who was worthy to open the scroll and to look inside of it. So when re realizing the apparent lack of there was no one worthy to open the scroll and this biblical expression, it says, I wept and I wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside. No one worthy? Could you imagine a Christianity without Jesus? Could you imagine a sense of a religion without Christ being in it? Can you, re can you imagine the gathering of the people of God without Christ being in the center of it? I mean, what would, what, 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 what would be the purpose? What would be the idea? What would be the sense of this? We would be another social club just meeting or another religion meeting for senseless purposes. John wept because he saw no one worthy. And the Bible says that they were looking and they could not find. But what's beautiful is that it doesn't stay there. Verse 5 says, Then one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. See the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. Okay, so the scene automatically says, John, hold on, you're not getting it. Look, pay attention. The lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. And then John says, then I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain, standing at the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. The lamb had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out in all, into all of the earth. See, it's already interpreted. The Bible, a basic rule, interprets itself. Okay? He went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat at the throne, and when he had taken it, 
the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb. Each one had a harp and they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of God's people. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. What a beautiful response to the apparent lack of no one being worthy to open the scroll. When John pays attention, when he realizes and he really understands, hold on, there is someone worthy. What's interesting in verse 9 is that it says, and they sang a new song. They sang a new song. You know what? That changed and that shifted the paradigm. That shifted everything in heaven. That shifted everything because now they recognize, they see, hold on, the lion of the tribe of Judah is worthy. The lamb that was slain is worthy. Hold on. We got to sing a new song. Amen. Something happened. Something changed. When they realized, see, each and one of us uh, at one point of our life were lost and senseless with no purpose. But when we met Jesus, our life was changed and we started to sing a new song. Amen, amen. We started to speak different. We started to believe differently. We started to see differently. Because of our encounter with Jesus. My friends, the lamb, the lamb of God is Jesus. Do you know who recognized the Lamb of God? John, in chapter John, first, uh, John 1 29. John was baptizing, he was already the baptizer. He had a prominent ministry. He was, you know, uh, it, doing his thing, you know, and baptizing, you know, a baptism of repentance. Repent, repent. And all of a sudden, Jesus walks into the scene, into the Jordan River. And what does John say? When he saw Jesus coming to him, he said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John was able to recognize immediately, there is the Lamb of God. And if you read the continuation of the Bible, says, the, the verse, it says, you know, he, he, he deemed himself even unworthy to even to tie the straps of his sandals. Because he recognized how unworthy he was before the Lamb of God, who was worthy of John's praise. And John said, you know what, I, I don't even want, you know, me baptizing you? How is this possible? And Jesus had to convince him. Jesus had to convince his cousin. He said, oh, hey, you know, I, you need to do what you need to do because everything that has been prophesied needs to be fulfilled. So you better take me into the water and, and dip me in. <laughs> Can you imagine what an honor? At this point, John the Baptist had been baptized, baptizing many. But at this point, he's baptizing Jesus, the Lamb of God, the one who takes away the sin of the world. So John recognized that. John the Baptist. One of the elders, now in this, going back to the scene in the book of Revelations, it's interesting that one of the elders, not an angel, was the one that rescued John from his grief. Because John was grieving. He was like weeping. He says, and I wept, and I wept, and I wept. You know, when someone repeats something, and it's something is repeated, it's, there's an emphasis there. This is not a normal weeping. He was grieving. And it was one of the elders that res rescued John from his grief showing him the one who had prevailed to open the scroll. Now, there's that word, prevailed. I love that word, prevailed. Why? 
because Jesus Christ prevailed a death. And he came back from the dead after three days. And he had promised that I, he was going to give a sign. Oh, you want a sign to the Pharisees? I'm going to give you a sign. And the same way that Jonah was in the belly of the fish, the same way the Son of Man is going to be buried. And the third day he's going to come back. Jesus prevailed. And he had prevailed to open the scroll. This one was the great figure of the Old Testament. The Old Testament prophecy speaks, spoke about the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, the Messiah of, uh, of Israel and of the Gentiles. So who is worthy to open the scroll? Who is worthy of our worship? It's obviously Jesus, as we know. But another question that I want to uh, present is, why is the Lamb of God worthy? Why is the Lamb of God worthy? Now, if we pay attention and we continue reading, again, because this is very important that we understand the realization of, or the understanding that the Lion of the tribe of Judah was worthy and that he went and took the scroll, you know, immediately the biblical scene says that the instruments immediately started to play. They started to fine tune their arps and they started, okay, we, we, there's something. And the new song was already starting to get prepared. Okay. And it says they sang again, the new song and they worshiped, they worshiped. Do you know how important worship is? We've just enjoyed the presence of God in worship and our worship this morning was not for us. Our worship was not for us. This was not a humanistic centered approach to worship. This is not a me, 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 me worship. This was a worship centered in God. Every song that was selected pointed to Jesus, pointed to the work of Christ, pointed to the work of the Lamb, the one who is worthy. When this happens, when this occurs, Things have to be different. They worshiped. And they said, you are worthy. This is the new song they sang. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain. And with your blood, you purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. How profound, how, how, how wonderful to understand that what made Jesus worthy, the Lamb of God, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, was the fact that with his blood, after being slain, purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. This is one of the reasons I'm so excited to be here this morning. This is one of the reasons I'm so excited to see what God is doing with two churches in one ministry. This is why I'm so excited to know that today, that yesterday we had five people groups represented. Some of them were Spanish, but we had people from Haiti that came to participate in an English program. He came to rescue and purchase persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. Now, because of the elders, announcement John probably expected to see a lion they said uh, behold the lion of the tribe of Judah okay I love lions from a distance obviously okay um, but the image is probably he, he thought he expected to see a lion but he actually saw a lamb instead John even used probably the specific words some people say in the original words to even say a little lamb. The lamb is presented in a way that's both sympathetic but also powerful. He is living because it says before stood a lamb, a lamb that was alive but still had the marks of the previous sacrifice upon him as though it had been slain. Before I continue, I, don't, I, 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 I am not going to apologize for my passion into what I am preaching today. 
Because to me, the passion of the word of God and this living truth makes me passionate. So if you see me a little charismatic, please bear with me because this is too powerful for me. Amen. This is too powerful to handle. When the men, men want symbols of power, they conjure uh, ferocious beasts, birds of prey, such as those that represent uh, nations, sports, and teams, the Wolves, the Rams, the Chicago Bulls. The Yankees is the only team that doesn't have to have a ferocious beast because they are the beast. As a Yankee fan, I will vouch for that. 27 championships or 28, that's it. But men, when they think about these things, they want to represent, you know, huge beast and ferocious beast to represent power. But the representative of the kingdom of heaven is a lamb. It's a lamb that's representing humility is representing gentleness and sacrificial love. What a representation of the kingdom of God. The song says, and you are worthy to take the scroll and open its seals because you were slain and with your blood you purchased for God per persons from every tribe and language people and nation. The idea, my friends, is that the sacrifice of Jesus is still fresh. It's still current. It's current before God the Father. There is nothing stale. There is nothing outworn in the work of Jesus on the cross. It is still active and alive for those that want to recognize Jesus as their savior. Now, thousands of years later, it is still fresh as the day that he hung on that cross and died on that cross. Why is he worthy? Why is he worthy? He is worthy because of that sacrificial offering of himself in the sight of God. And because of this sacrifice, you and I, we have communion with our Father, with God. We have been saved through that blood. Jesus did, did that for us. He enabled the way. Where there was no way, he enabled the way. He is the way to the Father. There is no other way. He is worthy because with his blood, he purchased for God. He purchased us for God. He purchased us for him. They sang a new song. It was a new thing. There's a theologian by the name of Victorinus that comments, it is a new thing that the Son of God should become man. You know, first of all, think about that. The fact that it begun with the Son of God becoming man. That was a new thing. Amen? It is a new thing to ascend into heavens with a body. That was a new thing. The first fruit of the resurrection, to go up to heaven with a body, Jesus Christ. That's a new thing. Something that heaven had not seen or experienced. It is a new thing to give remission of sins to men with one perfect sacrifice. And no longer the need of continual sacrifices and bloodshedding in an altar. It is a new thing for men to be sealed with the Holy Spirit because of Jesus Christ. It is a new thing to receive the priesthood of sacred observance and to look for a kingdom of unbounded promise, said Victorinus. You see, that required a new song to be sang. And the beautiful thing about that is 
we as believers, we have the blessing to sing the song of the redeemed. The redeemed. The redeemed. Because we are the beneficiaries of this gift. That's why he is worthy. Now, knowing who is worthy of our worship and why he is worthy of our worship, I want you to understand with me today that sustains us. One of the songs we were singing was, He Holds Me Fast. He Holds Me Fast. When we understand what Jesus has done, and when, when we understand how he bought us with the price of his own blood, and how he was slain for our transgressions, we realize that all we can do is live a life of worship unto him. I mean, sometimes I have difficulty. I, I know that the Christian life is not easy. I know that, that sometimes we are faced with different trials and different temptations and tribulations and different things that want to, you know, knock us off of, of, of our path. But the deeper that we continue to understand what God has done through Jesus Christ for us, our life of continued worship will sustain us in our walk. Because no matter what happens, all we need to do is look at the cross. All we need to do is look at Jesus and be reminded of what he's done for us. When we realize that we could have not done anything, we in ourselves could have done anything to save ourselves. That we needed a savior and that savior is Jesus Christ. We know that that sustains us. So in our Christian walk, God gives us strength. God gives us support physically and mentally, spiritually. And it is comforting to know that the Lord is the one who sustains us. We're not to look to our own strength to sustain us. We're not to look at our intellect to sustain us. Rather, we find all that we need in the Lord. He is completely capable, more than capable, of carrying our burden. We are not capable of carrying our burdens on our own. Going back to the passage, verse 11, then I looked and heard the voice of many angels numbering thousands upon thousands and 10,000 times 10,000. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders in a loud voice. They were saying, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them saying to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. This is a scene that lets us know this is how it has to be. Every single creature, every single being praising the Lord. God had already made a, prof, a promise that the prophet Isaiah expressed in Isaiah 46, 4, when he said, I have made you and carry you. I will sustain you. And this is where it makes sense, where it points to Jesus, and I will rescue you. Yeah. See, this is what Jesus has done. And he's the one that sustains us. See, God... Thoughtfully, because God is a thoughtful God, isn't he? He's a thoughtful God. He thoughtfully crafted you. Every single thing that makes you who you are was carefully chosen and was carefully knitted together by him. We are not an accident. 
We are not the way that we are be just because. He knows exactly what we need. He knows exactly what you need before you need it. And he will sustain you. He will sustain me. He will sustain us in all that he has called us to do. So in times of stressful situations and harsh hardships, in times of illness and infirmity and sickness and financial worries and uncertainty and so many different things, the Lord knows about all of these things. He knows them from beginning to end. And the beautiful thing is that he can make all those things work together for good. Because he is the one that sustains us. God is the only one who can see our lives from the very beginning to the end. He is the only one that knows our finale. Shoot, we don't know what's going to happen when we walk out these doors. We don't. God knows it. And what an assurance it is as believers to put our trust in a God that knows every step of our life so we could be sustained in him as we continue to put our trust in him. Sometimes we see things from our perspective and we can get worried. It's understandable. We can get anxious. It's understandable. Hey, we're just human beings, right? But because of that fragility is why we need to understand that we need God and to put our trust in God and to keep God at the center of our praise, to keep Jesus at the center of our praise. That is why we worship him. That is why he sustains us. The Lord is our foundation who gives us strength to persevere in life. The Lord is why we do not give up or give way, especially in those hard times. We desperately need our relationship with God, desperately, because without him we would be lost. So when we know who God is and why we worship him and who he is, what he's done, we can be sustained by him. And we have to do what Hebrews says in Hebrews 12. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. In this biblical scene that we see in Revelations, there is a cross-reference. Jesus sat at the throne of God, at the right-hand throne of God. Jesus showed up in the scene that John is seeing as the answer to the one that was worthy to open the scroll, everything that was written. See, the story of this church has already, already been written. And the only one worthy to open the scroll knows what's inside of it. And God is giving us a glimpse of what he wants us to do. And we are walking towards what he wants us to do, keeping him at the center of our worship because he is worthy of our worship. So in the times that we have ahead of us as a church, let us not forget why we are a church. Let us not forget why we exist to keep Jesus at the center of it all because Jesus is worthy of our worship because of whom he is and what he has done. Amen. Now, I'll confess to you. Allow me to be honest with you for a little bit. Part of me is scared. 
Uh, new things sometimes could be scary. New things could lots of times bring concerns. What's it going to be like? What's is this going to work? How are we going to do this? How are we going to do that? You know what I've learned through this message? That God has been up to something. <laughs> the Holy Spirit is up to something. You have been sensing it. You have been sensing it. And so have we. So have I. But as long as we live in biblical worship, in a presentation of our being ignited by the Holy Spirit, as a living sacrifice to God, because we recognize who he is and what he has done, there's nothing to be worried about. There is nothing to be worried about. Because worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and all glory and praise as we continue to move forward with what God wants us to do. All for what? For his glory. For his honor. Because he, he is worthy. He is worthy. Jesus is worthy of all praise, of all worship. Amen. Let us pray. Father God, oh, we come before you. Lord, I feel that your presence is heavy in the gathering of your people. Lord, this profound worship that focuses on you and recognizes you as the author of everything. It centers you at the center of our praise. Because it's not about us at the end of the day. It's all about you. Allows us to really rejoice. And you bless us with your presence as a response of our recognition to who you are. Thank you for this passage and for the vision that you allow John to see. And thank you because this brings us to a deeper understanding today of how important it is to keep our eyes fixed on you and to recognize that you are the one worthy of all praise. We don't seek stardom. We don't seek fame. That is not what brings glory to your name. What brings glory to your name is people living lives of continued worship and sacrifice upon to you in every aspect of what they do. Allow us, Father God, to continue to witness your power and what you will continue to do in this place for the glory and for the honor of your name because you have a story written and you know what it is and we believe it's victorious it's beautiful and that you're going to do great things for the glory and the honor of your name we thank you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you for the cross.
Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Yes. Oh, Lord, we're just so very thankful. Thankful for this morning. Thankful, Jesus, you were here. Uh, and we're just thankful, Lord. And let us remember each day that you are enough. Yes. We pray in Jesus' name. Yes, I couldn't help it. <laughs> Amen. 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 Amen.